Welcome to the Plant Trainers Podcast, where we're helping people improve their quality of life through nutrition and fitness. And now, your hosts, nutrition and wellness coaches, international speakers, Adam and Shoshana Chaim. Hey, I'm Adam Chaim. And I'm Shoshana Chaim, and we are Propelled, Propelled by, by plants. plants. Today, we bring to you episode 240, Understanding Heart Health with Dr. Jamie Delaney. In today's episode of the Plant Trainers Podcast, we talk to Dr. Jamie Delaney about everything you need to know about heart health and a plant-based diet, just in time to wrap up Heart Month. She walks us through how she embraced a plant-based diet personally and how she brought it into her practice. She has literally traded her scalpel for a spatula. She went from doing multiple procedures a day to teaching cooking and plant-based classes to educate her patients, help them make changes in life that will help them have the best chances of avoiding cardiac events. We also go through all the vocabulary you keep hearing about heart health to help you really understand what they all mean, including the important factors about cholesterol, oil, and baby aspirin. Dr. Delaney went to West Virginia University for undergraduate and medical school. She then did a residency and cardiology fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh. She was on the faculty at West Virginia U before moving to Florida to begin her private practice. Dr. Delaney is very excited about the potential to reverse disease through nutrition and has incorporated nutrition education classes into her primary care and cardiology practice. We know your time is valuable. Every minute matters and you're trying to improve your quality of life and we're so grateful you're choosing the Plant Trainers Podcast to help you do that. We're happy and we're extremely inspired to be able to bring you this free resource. In order to keep up with the podcast, all the amazing guests, content, editing, and posting, we've brought on an intern to join the Plant Trainers team. Woohoo! Those who are patrons have helped to make that possible. Your donations of one, three, ten, twenty, or fifty dollars a month help us make this podcast possible and is enabling our intern to learn the ropes of the plant-based podcasting world. So thank you and congratulations for being a part of that. If you want to be a part of helping us create more opportunity for others to learn and have this podcast listened to by even more individuals who are also looking to improve their quality of life, then you can go to patreon.com slash plant trainers and make your contribution today. For the price of a coffee, just a coffee. You can help and have the satisfaction of knowing that you're contributing to help improve someone else's quality of life. And now for a moment of gratitude. I've been going into classrooms to share my new book that's coming out quite soon, The Big Breath Book. And it's been wonderful to read this book before it's even in print to other children, see their reactions, see how they can connect with the main character. And it's just really wonderful to have that experience. And I'm grateful to be able to share it with children. I'm excited to see that book come out. It's going to be fun. So the Olympics just ended yesterday, and I'm just grateful to have had the opportunity over the last few weeks to watch the Olympics with our kids, with our family, and just share that whole experience. It's been a lot of fun. Go Canada! Dr. Jamie Delaney, thank you so much for being on the Plant Trainers Podcast today. Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. We're very excited to talk to you today. You're down in sunny Florida. We're up here in the cold mist of winter. And I was just in Florida, Adam, of course, as well, a couple of weeks ago. And it was we were just so grateful to be down there in the bright sunshine, in the nice weather. Do you have a moment of gratitude that you want to share with our listeners today? You know, I am so grateful that it's uh, February and Heart Month, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for all the patients that I have and that have trusted my their hearts with me, and uh, it's just a pleasure uh, to be a, a part of so many uh, people's lives, helping them to become as heart healthy as they possibly can this month. That's great that you have a whole month for your whole area of expertise. <laughs> it's so amazing that so many cardiologists have turn to plant-based nutrition to really help their patients. So why don't you tell us how, as a cardiologist, you actually got into plant-based nutrition and how you're using that to help your patients? You know, it was, I guess, a little self-centered. Um, I, I went into cardiology because um, I have a terrible family history myself. Uh, my one grandmother died at 56 of heart uh, disease and heart failure and diabetes. My grandfather died at 48 of heart disease and a heart attack. Another grandmother died of heart disease. And so that kind of led me to 
cardiology as a kid. I can remember riding in the car as taking them to the hospital. And um, I, I didn't want that disease and uh, heart disease. And, I, and, it, and you know, I, I wanted to try to prevent it in my family and other people's uh, family. But as I was practicing cardiology, as I was getting older, I was, uh, you know, I, I was afraid that I was going to get those same diseases. So I actually started running to try to, you know, outrun it doing marathons. And I, I still noticed that my cholesterol was starting to creep up despite being a runner. And ironically, a, a girl in the cath lab gave me a book called A Diet for a New America uh, by John Robbins. And I read that book and I was so amazed. You know, I'd grown up in West Virginia and you know, I always tell people I, you know, I only ate fruit that was in a pie and I had all, you know, everything you could imagine to eat bad, I did. And when I read that book, I was so amazed as far as, you know, nutrition and your heart, uh, because we told people to exercise and eat healthy, but that was healthy for the standard American diet type of, you know, uh, healthy. So immediately I became vegan. And of course, I tried with Dean Ornish's book to give to people. Uh, and, and, and that didn't work so well. You know, I say, you know, here's this book. It's really complicated and it's really strict. If you can do it, it'll really help you. But but when I heard Dr. Esselstyn speak uh, in Forks Over Knives about how he taught people and he showed people, uh, he, he showed them the science behind plant-based nutrition. And then he showed them how to actually prepare the food. Um, I knew that's what I wanted to do in my practice. So that was the beginning. And when I started teaching nutrition in my practice by cooking for my patients and doing uh, demos and, and doing PowerPoint slides of the why, all of a sudden I started having amazing results with my patients. Their chest pain went away, their stress test improved, their heart failure went away, their diabetes got better. And, you know, it was like, I can't go back now. I think it's so amazing that, first of all, if we had an apple for everybody who said Diet of a New America helped them with their journey, we'd be able to feed our family for a week. But, um, you know, the other thing is that Dr. Esselstyn, as strict as his ways are, it's really quite simple, right? His strictness is just don't eat these things, but then you have a huge variety of other things that you can eat and you don't have to worry about ratios or what you're eating together. It's just, you know, you just eat you just do it you just enjoy and it really gets you there and, and when you do show people the science and when they do buy into it and they start trying it on their own and realize that they can manage it on their own the outcome just speaks for itself yeah it, you know it, it is simple it's just whole foods and it looks pretty and it tastes good and uh you know it, it's simple you know I've, I've we've had con he and i've had conversations together and you know about the you know, the nuts, you know, some doctors will say, you know, nuts here, how much can you have? And, uh, you know, it, it, when you start complicating the waters or muddying the waters, sometimes it can become very simple or become very complicated. So uh, by just sticking to, you know, looking, eat mainly whole foods, eat vegetables, fruits, whole grains, uh, it works out really well. Absolutely. So were you plant based before you started your practice or does this come after? Oh, no, no. I, I, I started in my practice in 1998. We started about um, six years ago, introducing plant based nutrition probably into the practice. It was funny. I was vegan for uh, quite a while before I ever considered it for my patients or, you know, tried to implement it, it was basically when Forks Over Knives came out. So what was the reaction of your colleagues, your staff? and your clients when you brought this to the office? It was funny because, you know, as you probably have experienced, once you know this, you want to share this information with everyone. And, you know, you're all excited to share this information. And so everybody that would come to see me for chest pain or an abnormal EKG or shortness of breath, I would, you know, talk to them a little bit. And then I kind of push back my chair and then I would start the plant-based nutrition lecture and they weren't expecting to hear that from me as a patient. They were expecting, get your, you know, we'll schedule your catheterization, we'll schedule your stress test, well, here's your medications. And, you know, I, I, at the end of the day, I was trying to talk to so many people, I would actually start to become hoarse because, I, you know, in a, in a short office visit, you're trying to, to cram all this in, you know, forks over knives in 15 minutes. And it, it was, you know, it was a bit frustrating to do it that way. You know, some people you would reach and some people you weren't. And it was like, it was a good day if, you know, if I got two people that actually didn't think I was crazy. My colleagues, they didn't want anything of it. Uh, I had colleagues, you know, tell me in the doctor's lounge, well, what would happen if we, you know, if everybody got, if everybody was cured from heart disease, what would you do? You know, and it's, you know, I think we've, we've got a ways to go in our lifetime before we can, we can do that. So, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to, if, if everybody I see from, you know, from this day forward, I cure a heart disease and then that would be a good life for me. 
So does that mean that they weren't willing to explore it because that would mean that ethically they'd have to tell their patients about it and they'd be actually scared of not having their waiting room full and that their ethics isn't where it should be? I mean, I don't want, I don't want to be like you're calling them out, but. No, I, I mean, I, I really, um, you know, the first reaction to people is people just, they don't, they, people just want a quick cure. They, they, they just want a pill. It takes too long. Um, but there is, there is very much a financial incentive for doing procedures. You can do procedures. People feel better quickly for the short period of time. And you don't have to tell anybody anything bad about their bad habits. So you can continue to, you know, eat your steak and cheeseburgers and we'll put this stent in. You have to take all these three or four medications, but we're going to, we're going to put this stent in and you'll be good and I'll be great. and I'm a hero and you know, you can do what you want. And so that, that continues to perpetuate itself. Uh, it takes a lot more time. It takes a tremendous amount of time, as you know, to talk to people that have never heard of plant-based nutrition and explain that, you know, what you eat can actually affect your health and even, you know, and, and even more, what you have been eating has affected your health. You know, because nobody wants to say they caused or want to think they caused their heart disease or they caused their cancer, they caused their autoimmune disease. And, and, you, and the physician, you don't want to start blaming people either, but you want to educate them. And so it takes time to subtly bring that up that, you know, it's like, OK, this is the way we all were raised for the most part. But, you know, this is what we can do to actually take our health back. And, and it's not easy and it's not quick. And unfortunately, you know, the shiny objects went out, you know, the, the, the pills and the procedures. That's where reimbursement is here in the United States. You know, so it's, it's quick. And we want the quick fix. So you have literally traded the scalpel for the spatula. Yes, yes. I probably used to do, you know, sometimes six catheterizations a day. I haven't, uh, I think I've done one in the last six weeks uh, for somebody that was acutely ill. I do three nutrition classes, like cooking classes a week. Uh, we have three different, three different levels. Uh, beginner, where we talk about the science of plant-based nutrition from heart disease, nitric oxide, diabetes, hypertension, and all the way up to you know, the latest and greatest science and advanced cooking techniques. And uh, so that's where I spend, you know, at least each class is about an hour and a half long. So that's the majority of my time. I want to stop you there. I, I love that. I think that that's amazing that you're willing to do that for your for your clients, for your business, for your for your life, right? You're you've you've literally said I'm going to save people and put that ahead of all of these procedures that are quite costly to people. And let's face it, pay your mortgage at the same time. But you found other ways to 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 help them. And I absolutely love them. So we've already mentioned some vocabulary today. And what I really wanted to do is I wanted to take a step backwards and bring myself back to about 15 years ago, when I really didn't know much about health in terms of the heart and all of that, um, before I got into plant based nutrition, and a lot of questions that I get from when I'm speaking at lectures, or when I have clients, or just in general in Facebook groups, people are asking, what these vocabularies mean. So let's go through them, not too, not too deep, but just to get an idea. So you've already mentioned catheter. So can you explain what that means? The gold standard for looking at people's coronary arteries or the arteries that feed your heart blood is to use a catheter or a tube. And the tube is either placed through the artery in the arm or the artery in the leg. And it's, um, it goes up to the heart and we actually engage those coronary arteries that sit on top of the heart like a football. And we shoot contrast down them to see whether or not there are blockages. Um, that catheter is uh, roughly the size of the, you know, the insert to your ballpoint pen. All right. And then, so if somebody's having a heart attack, can you explain what's happening there? An acute uh, myocardial infarction um, or a heart attack is when there's a complete obstruction of blood flow that happens pretty acutely in a blood vessel that feeds the heart blood. And it may start out the night before, the day before, at like maybe a 20% blockage. So we have these endothelial cells that line our, our blood vessels. And over time with what we eat, um, they become raised. Uh, I, I look, I, I think of it as um, soap scum in, scum in a drain or, you know, uh, or an irregular bumpy road that needs to be repaved. Uh, and so it's not smooth. And these plaques or these endothelial cells, there, there's a bunch of inflammation, cholesterol plaques underneath of them. And, and the cholesterol is actually very sharp. And these, if you look under an electron microscope, they're actually very pointy. And they can actually pierce through this plaque. And when it does, it, it, it's like a cut. 
And so your body's normal response to a cut is to clot the blood, just like if you were to cut your knee and you get a blood, you, you, know, you, get, a, you get a clot over top of it that, that stops the bleeding. That happens inside the blood vessel. And so since the blood vessels are so tiny, smaller than a pen, when that clot occurs, if it occludes that whole vessel, blood flow no longer goes downstream to the rest of the heart and that muscle becomes starved for oxygen and a heart attack occurs. I was going to say, I like to think of it as a highway because that's how I explain it in a lot of my lectures, how when Adam had his heart disease, that his arteries became like a one lane highway instead of a two lane highway. So you have all the debris from the trees and stuff on the side of the highway that start to fall in. And eventually, if those big trees fall over and block it, traffic can't get through. Right. And depending. So sometimes that it, it doesn't block it all the way and then it actually settles down. And so that's how we get these blockages over time that become 50, 60, 70 percent. And those are the kind we pick up with a stress test. But the, 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 the kind that are most dangerous are what we call these soft plaques that, you know, have this lipid underneath of them and this inflammation. And again, they can rupture and then the blood flow stops completely. So it's it's like you know, there was the, the flow is dammed up. It's, it's a complete obstruction on the highway and, and blood can't get through. And then a stroke. How do we explain that one? Similar thing. It's just the arteries to the brain. Um, so it can be that a clot broke off from downstream, uh, say from the carotid arteries or the arteries in your neck and went north to your, the brain arteries. And so the, you know, it's like the boulder going down the hill. It gets stuck eventually between the, you know, where the, it becomes the smallest. Or we can also have just the growth of a plaque in these tiny blood vessels in the brain that actually start to cause the blood flow not to occur in, the, in a particular area. So when do you use a stent? Is that that's specifically in the heart when you have to skip over? A, why don't you just explain it? <laughs> So if you're if you're having the big one, so to speak, you know, when the when the chest pain, uh, you know, the the chest pain associated with a heaviness, the elephant sitting on your chest, uh, oftentimes with cold sweats and shortness of breath, you come to the hospital. The EKG shows specific changes, and we do a heart catheterization, and that and that artery is completely blocked. That's when a stent is life saving. That stent is first a balloon is is put into that blocked area, and sort of the debris is moved aside. And then a stent is placed to hold the debris back. It's, it's like putting a wall up against a rock slide uh, to keep the rocks from coming back down into the road. Um, and so that, that's where a stent is life-saving. Um, a stent can be also be put in the carotid artery to the, to the brain, to, where the, in the neck artery, if that is being blocked or the blood flow to the, to the brain is being blocked. Um, that's usually not done acutely, but it can be done, you know, if there's a, you know, there's been a stroke has settled down, so to speak. My grandmother had a stent put in, they put it in through her hip, but it's not actually in her hip. Is that right? Right. So there, so well, you can, so a coronary artery stent is typically in the coronary arteries that feed the heart blood. Um, but people also have vascular disease in any artery. So if you have vascular disease in your leg arteries, in the iliac vessels in your pelvis, or in the arteries that go to your legs, a stent can be placed there to open it up to improve blood flow. That's a mechanical way of fixing it. Um, we know now that there are other ways to fix it besides the mechanical way there. There was recently uh, a study done that, you know, we put a lot of stents in to coronary arteries, to leg arteries, to arteries that go to the kidneys. But we know that the life-saving ones are the ones when the, block, when the blood is completely blocked off. The rest of these are probably better treated through, you know, medical means and particularly lifestyle means. So at what point when a patient comes to you, do you say, you know what, let's take a look at the nutrition and try to treat you with plant-based nutrition rather than medication? We're taking a pause to let you know that this episode of the Plant Trainers podcast is sponsored by Health IQ. Health IQ uses science and data to secure low rates on life insurance for health-conscious people like runners, cyclists, triathletes, strength trainers, vegans, and more. As we get older, we get scared about applying for life insurance because traditionally, the older you are, the worse the rates get. But imagine being 20 years older and getting a better rate on your life insurance because you recently started training for life, eating more plants, and taking better care of yourself. That's what happens when you apply for life insurance with Health IQ. You get the best rates on life insurance for being in great shape and living a healthy lifestyle. Health IQ customers save up to 33% on their life insurance because physically active people have a 56% lower risk of heart disease, 
20% lower risk of cancer and 58% lower risk of diabetes compared to people who are inactive, and vegans have a 9% lower risk of cardiovascular disease and 15% lower rate of all-cause mortality. Like saving money on your car insurance for being a good driver, Health IQ saves you money on your life insurance for living a healthy, conscious lifestyle. These savings are exclusive to Health IQ, and you must qualify to get the special rate. To see if you qualify, get your free quote today at healthiq.com slash plant trainers or mention the promo code plant trainers when you talk to a health IQ agent. And now back to the show. When I first started doing plant-based nutrition and it, and it wasn't as much of my practice, um, so people would come for, like you say, they would come in with chest pain and you know they're looking for answers. They're looking for what needs to be done to make this go away. And so I explain it. First of all, I assess, I assess their, their level of cuteness. So if, if somebody tells me they walk and they get chest pain and then they stop and it goes away um, and say they can walk 100 yards and then maybe, you know, maybe they could have walked three miles, but now they can only walk 100 miles and they get chest discomfort. We still have time to work on things a variety of ways. If they tell me that, you know, it wakes them up from a sound sleep, this chest discomfort uh, or without doing anything, they, they're getting this chest discomfort. Then, you know, things have progressed to a point where we don't have as many options early on. That's, that's, that's getting pretty, uh, you know, because basically they're not getting the blood flow to their heart when they're not doing anything, just at rest. Those people oftentimes need intervention more than not. But if the person that, ha- that can walk and then they get chest pain and they stop and it goes away, then we have, we have options. So the options, you know, are, you know, hey, we can take a look and see if there's a blockage. And if there's a blockage, then we can decide what to do. Uh, it may be such that we do nothing um, except medications and, and or that there can be a stent place. But then there's this, you know, this other alternative is, is nutrition. And, you know, we can work together and we can actually make this better. You know, you talked about the freeway being blocked. And I, and I often describe it that way as well, that if the freeway is blocked, we, have, we can open up all these side streets, then your chest discomfort will go away. And you can gradually heal the freeway over time with what you eat. And if I get the sense that people, they, if they're interested in that, then we certainly pursue it because we have time on our side. You know, we can we can work with them. We, we put them right into our nutrition class because they need to know, you know, those people, they don't have the option of, you know, okay, I'll take out beef this month and I'll take out dairy next month or I'll do this. You know, it's not a gradual weaning. We need to, we need to get their diet squared away fairly quickly. So we like to get them right into a nutrition class, and and right then and there, I'll you know I, I have a, a legal pad in my every off every exam room, and I, I just start writing, you know breakfast, you know we want you to eat oatmeal, we want you to have flaxseed, uh, we want you to have a couple cups of berries, we want you to have five cups of greens a day, you know, and if this is something that you can do at lunch, we're going to have a big green salad, uh, we're going to have spinach, kale, you know, we want you to have beans, whole grains, and and if and if I can see that they're going to work with me on that then we have time and, and we can really make great progress in a short period of time. If you make a little uh, thing on the computer and print it up, it'll save you some wrist work. You know, it, it's it's not as, you know, when you hand people a sheet of paper, yeah, they don't get it. And, and then you could also go through, if you say oatmeal and they say, I've never been able to eat oatmeal in my life, well, then you could come up with something different and you could put it down on the paper too. I was just being cheeky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's something about writing it and going over with step by step, you know, and, and we do. What, you know, what, what do you eat now? You know, one of my greatest questions is, uh, you know, what did you eat for dinner last night? And, you know, everybody says salad, you know, everybody says they, they give you the answer they want you, they, you know, that you want to hear. And it's like, well, what was all this? You know, 30 minutes later, you really figure out what they ate. You know, it, it's, it's time. It's, it's not, a, you know, if it were as easy as to give people here's your menus for the next week and you do it, then it would be great. And but it's but it's just not because, as you know, a lot of people don't cook at all. Uh, you know, they've never had, I have people that, that couldn't identify vegetables. Part of our nutrition, part of the nutrition classes that I teach is we go shopping together and we go through the produce aisles and, and you would be amazed at how many people can't identify two thirds of the vegetables. I, I can't, um, I can't see that. It's crazy. We've always grown up with vegetables on our plate. So when I do hear about that or people who don't understand that carrots don't come in a can, Right. Um, the, these are the things that, you know, really make me want to educate more people, especially our young ones. 
right? We've got to educate the young ones. And as we educate the young ones, they educate their families too. So we are reaching the adults. And sometimes I think it's better education going for the children and the children educating the adults as opposed to educating the adults and hoping that they're going to educate their children as well. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a whole different mindset. People think that, you know, they're depriving their children if they're not getting the Happy Meal. They don't think about, you know, you can just pour anything into these kids and they'll, and they'll grow. And they don't see that, you know, their IQs will be much better. You know, their, their performance in school would be much better if they were given proper nutrition. Nobody thinks about it. It's quick. We have to get to, you know, there's more emphasis placed on soccer practice than there is on dinner. You know, so if there's programs in the schools that educate the kids, then, then that's very helpful. Because it, it, there's studies shown that if you put the fruits first in the cafeteria line, they'll, they'll eat them. If you show them how to grow lettuce, then they're more likely to eat it in, in the classroom or in the cafeteria than if they haven't seen it and it just in, ends up on their plate. So, yeah, we definitely have to, you know, educate the kids uh, and make it cool to eat vegetables. That's what inspired us to write our yummy foods activity book for kids where it's all different kinds of puzzles, right? So it's cool. It's got crosswords. It's got wonder words. It's got fill in the blanks, mad libs, what have you. But really what they're doing is they're being educated and they're being opened up to different kinds of foods that they're not used to, understanding why different kinds of foods grow in different places, you know, and how the foods really affect their body. So, you know, that's something that we put out there because we just want to be able to educate more and more children. And we're hoping that it's not just going into families where that kind of work's being done already. Of course, we want to help support that, but we want to get it into families where that kind of work isn't being done. And you're right. Parents feel as if kids are missing out if they're not going to McDonald's. But what they're really doing is they're starting them off early for for high cholesterol, right, for these heart diseases to inevitably end up in in your office later on in life. And research is showing that kids as of the age of 10 are starting to develop heart disease. So we really need to make sure that we're limiting, if not completely eliminating, then at least eliminating a lot of the cholesterol that that children are eating. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, you know, a family that, that cooks together, you know, and eats dinner together, it's just, it's just all good. You know, I mean, I have fond memories of, you know, being with my grandmother and, and, and her cooking and, you know, she showed her love by what she made us to eat. You know, looking back, there were some things that, you know, weren't the, the greatest in the world, but the, the, the memories are by being with her and cooking together. And so families that, you know, incorporate the kids in, you know, the prep, uh, it's much better than, you know, just go through the window together and scream and holler and, you know, pound down the fries. So in terms of that heart disease that I was just talking about and cholesterol for the kids, let's talk a little bit about high cholesterol and low cholesterol or good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, because what I find with a lot of my clients is that they don't understand the correlation between, they they think that they want a very high good cholesterol and a very low bad cholesterol. So can you clear that up so that I could just always tell people just to come listen to this podcast? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, 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 it's it's you know um, people worry about their good cholesterol and more than they worry about their bad cholesterol. I guess we want to you know it's one time in life we want to focus on the good and not the bad. Um, the first is the total cholesterol. You know we know in areas of the world that if their cholesterol is naturally that's without statins at 150, they're they're pretty much heart attack proof. You know game over when you alter you know, when you lower the cholesterol artificially with statins it changes that protection effect and we can talk about that a little bit later. And then when we look at the bad cholesterol, the LDL or the lousy cholesterol, as we call it, you know, we like that as low as we possibly can get, less than 70 if we can. The good cholesterol, the HDL, I'm not so worried about it. You know, it's uh, we talk about like garbage trucks. So if you've got a lot, if you don't have very much garbage, you don't need a lot of garbage trucks. So if you don't have a lot of cholesterol, you don't need a lot of HDL to go pick it up and bring it back to the liver and, and degrade. And, and we've tried that, you know, with pharmaceuticals to artificially increase the good cholesterol and it resulted in more heart attacks. So it, it, there's, there's, no, there's no reason to target that specifically. Um, we want to target the total cholesterol and the bad cholesterol by, by what we eat and the good cholesterol takes care of itself. And in countries, again, where they're essentially heart attack proof with, with the total cholesterol is 140, 150, they can have LDLs in the 20s and still be perfectly fine. I think we need to change that word good cholesterol, right? We need to rename it because just because it's good, it doesn't mean that you necessarily need abundance of it. You know, I think I I always remember HDL as happy cholesterol. And that's how I remember that it's, it's the not as bad one. (laughs) 
Yeah, and, and people say, oh, well, my doctor said I didn't need to do anything because I have good, high, I have a lot of good cholesterol. And it's like, well, yeah, but you have a lot of, you know, bad cholesterol. You have a lot of total cholesterol, uh, and that's the problem. And the same, you know, same way as, you know, we hear, uh, you know, they came to the hospital, but their cholesterol wasn't that high, and they, they still had a heart attack, you know, so it wasn't anything to do with their cholesterol. Well, the reality of it is their, their bad cholesterol, their, their cholesterol was high when we compare it to what normal really is, you know, that 60 to 70 range. So, yeah, we see people all the time with LDLs or bad cholesterol of 110 with heart attacks. You know, that's not protective. Um, it would be according to the pharmacy, you know, according to the labs, but, it, but that's not what, get you, what gets you heart attack proof. So I heard a commercial on the radio the other day, and I wish I could have rewound it, but it wasn't television, so I couldn't rewind it. But I do believe it was an aspirin commercial telling people after having a cardiac event to take two baby aspirin. Now, there was no mention that I could remember of talking to your doctor about taking baby aspirin or anything like that, but literally just telling people to go out and take baby aspirin. That that's not safe, correct? We know that, you know, so your platelets last for um, uh, a, a, about a, a two weeks to a month. We turn turn our red cells over uh, and our, we turn our platelets over. And if you take if you take a baby aspirin, you decrease the abilities of your platelets to stick together and form clots. And there have been studies uh, in acute heart attacks that if you take an aspirin, you will decrease, uh, you know, the death from heart attacks. We give people an aspirin when they come in for, for chest pain. And we know that in men who have had a heart attack, that a baby aspirin a day is protective if it's in a setting that they don't have other risk factors for bleeding, you know, so it's not a, uh, it's not a one, one thing fits all. But the study's never been done in women to show that taking an aspirin just because, you know, I'm 55 and I might have heart attack or heart disease. No, there's no evidence that just taking an aspirin for the heck of it is, is beneficial. And then you also have people who are on all kinds of other medications. And what if they're already on a blood thinner or something like that? I just thought it was really negligent. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe it that they were just telling people to go out and do that. And if you're a heart patient, you need to consult your doctor. You know, abs- absolutely. You know, their medication interactions are, ex- you know, extreme, especially now that people are on so many different medications and so many different varieties of blood thinners. Yeah, so that, you know, you, you should consult your doctor. And of course, there's so many other risk factors. If you've had a bleeding stroke in the past, or if you, you know, if you've had bleeding complications, if you're prone to falling, you know, so th- there are, are risk factors. Um, so just, you know, these, because medications are over the counter, doesn't make them safe, whether they be proton pump inhibitors, aspirin, Tylenol, or anything. What are the factors that you need to consider when coming off aspirin if your doctor has had you taking baby aspirin and you decide on your own, I'm eat, drinking smoothies every day, I'm doing better, I'm not going to go back to the doctor, I'm just going to stop them? <laughs> you know, really, you need to be able to communicate with your physician and discuss, you know, what's my risk? What what are these drugs actually doing for me? You know, there's it's just not like being that parent that says, you know, you need to do this just because. Um, so, so what are the benefits and what are the risks for me? And, you know, as a patient, you deserve to be educated, um, the risks and benefits of every medication and every potential treatments that then allow you to make that decision that if you want to take that risk or, you know, maybe it's not a risk, maybe it's a risk taking the medication. So, but I think that you know, you, you need, you, you deserve to be educated as much as possible so that you can make a good decision. I'm going to switch gears here for a minute. I noticed you put your hand up before and you're wearing, I think it's a Garmin 920. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Which means that, and you mentioned you're a runner before, but that also tells me that you're probably a triathlete and I would guess you've done some Ironman races. Some marathons. Um, I've completed five. Yeah, uh, over yeah, over twenty five marathons and uh, five Ironmans. Yeah, so I'm, so actually, I, didn't, I didn't think we were going to be on, but I do have an Ironman T-shirt on. Oh. Well, they, they can't see bit. it, but maybe yeah. we could screenshot it. Yeah, yeah. just a uh, bit. So I guess one of the questions I have is, uh, when you said you went plant based fully not too long ago, but were any of these Ironman races done on a standard American diet? And if so, once you made the transition. How did you react? How did you feel? How did the training go? How did your life change athletically? All my Ironman have been uh, plant-based, but I, I ran a few marathons before I was uh, before I was completely plant-based. You know, 100. Um, percent 
Uh, and what I what I notice is the re- the recovery. Um, it's just amazing. You know, finish a marathon and the next day I can go run, not sore. Just you know, the recovery from training. Uh, and, and it's evolved, you know, um, the, the standard, you know, if you if you read training manuals, you know, you go out and you do a long run, 18 miles or whatever, you do a long bike and they'll say, you know, come back and you need to have, you need to have food and you need to have a protein source to be able to uh, absorb that carbohydrate. Well, what I found is that when we do a hundred mile bike ride or a 20 mile run, the best thing I can come in and do is, uh, a, a big smoothie with watermelon and cherries and bananas, or just eat, you know, a half a watermelon because it's so hydrating. I get the carbohydrates and the sugar with the watermelon and the nutrients and the antioxidants. So, so it's been my practice that, you know, the most, the more fruit I can get in after a long training run or, uh, uh, an event, the, the best, the better. And, you know, and the rest of the calories I just eat, you know, however I feel. I eat when I'm hungry and what and the normal food that I typically eat. The funniest thing is the day before an Ironman, um, you know, I don't know if you all do Ironman races or any of the events, but, you know, the Ironman village, you know, the, everybody's all uptight, you know, and they're looking at people and, and you go to a restaurant or whatever and everybody's worried about what they're eating. And, you know, we're sitting there eating giant salads and, and they'll see the the bracelet on your wrist that you know you're racing the next day, and it's like, oh, you're eating that big salad the day before, you know, a marathon. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna eat another one later on too. You know, the more I can get in, the the more of these greens, and we take beets with us, you know, and and um, you know we get the green, the kale, and the beets, and and um, that's that's what it's all about. So the general public has a no fiber rule, like three days before their <laughs> before their race. Yeah, and they're. They're carb loading on their pizza and pasta and yeah. No, I'd rather do the whole foods. Um, it was funny. Um, we went, we did a Miami marathon and we, we actually went to a raw restaurant. We were eating, uh, you know, this, this big raw dinner the night before. And I had like one of my best races and everybody was laughing. It's like, Oh my goodness. How did you stay out of the port of jaw? And it's like, no, it's not a problem. When you're used to eating this way, it's, it's really good. And you, you digesting is clean burning fuel. It's jet fuel. You know, you, uh, you, you burn it clean and, uh, it's just it's just great so what's your post-race meal do you want um, to share that <laughs> yeah no so watermelon. yeah that's yeah it's watermelon you know so whatever you know if we're traveling you know to at a race that we usually actually bring our instapot and uh, we have it in the hotel room and i'll make um some of those little potatoes and i'll have rice and then we'll have you know some steamed vegetables that we'll get from other places so when we come in you know we usually because sometimes after 12 14 hours you know, your stomach's not great, but the potatoes, you know, or rice, that, that tastes great. So that'll, that'll be what we'll start with and then just progress to fruits and vegetables and, uh, you know, continue on. I bring the rice cooker with the steamer. That way I could make the rice and the vegetables on top all at once for him. And yeah, we're smooth sailing in that hotel room. <laughs> yeah. So, so as a cardiologist and as an athlete, how do you feel about the oil the, the coconut oil and the olive oil. And that's, it's a huge controversy when it comes to oil. So what's your thoughts on that? It, it's a, you know, it's 45 olives that have been stripped of its antioxidants and nutrients that becomes a, a source of inflammation in your body, basically. So, you know, from a cardiology perspective, you know, we see sugars go up, diabetes, diabetes is essentially not reversible with oil in the diet, um, vascular disease, you have constriction. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a no, no from a personal aspect. You know, when I first went plant-based as an athlete, you know, weight wasn't a problem. So I wasn't too real concerned with olive oil and that stuff, but, but I'd always suffered as my mother had suffered from indigestion, you know, gastroesophageal reflux. And I just assumed it was my profession and my genetics. When I eliminated oil from my diet, it went completely away. And that was, you know, that was just amazing to me because I had taken medication over the years for this reflux and, um, you know, always blamed something, you know, basically my genetics. The, the best part about it, though, was my 78-year-old mother, when she gave up oil after 50 years of taking medication, no longer no longer takes any medicine for acid reflux uh, after she eliminated oil. And actually, she, you know, we just got done dinner and we just had these... Uh, burrito bowls with rice and beans and hot jalapeno peppers and we were laughing because we were both sweating (laughs) eating these hot peppers and nobody has any indigestion problems you know and it's just amazing so now the oil is inflammatory 10 years ago that would have been an issue for you too oh absolutely 
And same same for coconut oil, or is that different? Yeah, it's you know coconut oil is mainly saturated oil, saturated fats, you know, and it's it, but it's again it's it's devoid of you know the fiber and the nutrients, and it's just it's just inflammatory that you get to absorb really really quick. If I want to make a dish, you know, a Thai dish with coconut flavoring, I may take some coconut meat and put it in my Vitamix with water and use that, or even almond milk and a little coconut extract. But, uh, you know, it's better to eat the coconut than the oil. It's better to eat the olives than the oil. Right. That makes and sense. what about coconut milk? Will you use that sometimes too? I don't, um, just because I'm not a fan of it, you know, but a little coconut milk that's in the, you know, the, the kind, not the kind in the can, you know, but the, the kind in a container, perhaps a little bit, but I'm not a big fan. I'm not, you know, for the most part, I'll, you know, I, I may use a little bit of nut milk for cooking now and then, but just to drink it or, you know, not really. So you're doing a lot of amazing work with your patients, with the nutrition classes and teaching them all about plant-based nutrition. And you have an annual event that's coming up, your plant-based nutrition conference. So we wanted to give you a moment to maybe explain what goes on there and maybe we can get some of our listeners to show up. Yeah, um, so this will be the third year that I've hosted a day of nutrition. So we call it the third annual Charlotte County, which is where I live, plant-based nutrition conference. And we bring speakers in. Dr. Doug Lyle will be there this year, Tim Marie Hagenberger, uh, my daughter, Addie Delaney Minor, she's a registered dietitian, and myself will be speaking. And, and we have a whole food plant-based breakfast and lunch with no oil, salt, or sugar, and uh you know, so it's a just one of those huge. It's a day where we do cooking demonstrations. Uh, it's an intimate audience of a, or intimate uh, room of about 200 people, so people can ask their questions. And it's just a positive day to be in a room with like-minded people that are interested in, in health and wellness. Um, so we really, really enjoy it. So if anybody's out there would like to come, we you know be more than happy to host you. And the day before, we actually uh, have available you know consultations with myself and the registered dietitians, as well as uh, some yoga classes if people want to come in and make a weekend of it. So it's a lot of fun. So we will link to that in the show notes for sure if anybody wants to check that out at planttrainers.com. If you'd like other people to know where to reach out to you, where should they go? Uh, best place is drdelaney.com, and it's spelled out D-O-C-T-O-R-D-U-L-A-N-E-Y, and it has um, all the information about our practice, which is a membership practice, as well as the podcast that I do, Jamie Delaney Plant-Based Wellness Podcast, and I'm on Instagram at Jamila Delaney. Uh, that's my Instagram and, and Facebook. So we will link to that as well. We wanted to take... Before we let you go, <laughs> for anybody listening that's looking to improve their heart health, what kind of tips would you be able to give them that they could probably implement right now? Yeah, I, you know, I, I'd say, you know, right now, eat those five cups of the greens, the kale, spinach, cabbage, Swiss chard, collard greens, mustard greens. Put those five cups in your diet and take out the, the dairy and the animal protein. Awesome tips. I mean, it makes Simple. complete sense. It's very easy to do. And yeah, thank you so much for spending some time with us. I'm sure that a lot of people are going to learn so much from what we discussed today. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah we'll have to have you on uh, our, our my podcast so we can uh, get your word out as well. So you're doing great work up uh, uh, in Toronto. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. That'd yeah. be awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this edition of the Plant Trainers Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or any other podcast listening platforms. We appreciate the feedback we receive from you. Every time we get a five-star rating or review on iTunes from one of our fans, it ensures other people will find us too. Thanks to our patrons. To become a patron, visit www.patreon.com slash plant trainers. Even supporting us with $1 really makes a difference. Connect and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Plant Trainers. Like Plant Trainers on Facebook, join our newsletter, and check out our website at www.planttrainers.com for awesome plant-based recipes and a list of our services. Email your questions to info at planttrainers.com so we can answer them on our upcoming Facebook Lives. We hope we've inspired you today. Join us again next time and have a healthy day.